Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this uh, Festival of Ideas event. This evening, we're going to be uh, hearing from Dr. Norman Swan on the topic of human longevity. Is the face of survival changing? Uh, many of you will know uh, Dr. Norman Swan as the host of uh, Radio National's uh, Health Report on Monday mornings. And uh, Dr. Swan uh, trained as a paediatrician before beginning work as an ABC broadcaster. Uh, in addition to his radio work, he's also uh, featured on uh, uh, Catalyst and on Four Corners. Can I ask, and after uh, Dr. Swan has addressed us, we'll then have uh, an opportunity for you to ask uh, him uh, whatever questions occur to you on this very interesting subject. Can I ask you all please to welcome Dr. Norman Swan. Thank you, uh, Anthony, and uh, thank you all for coming out on a Friday night. That's, uh, well, it's not a Friday night, is it? It is a Friday night, yes. Yeah, I was <laughs> slightly confused here. My, the days blur into one another. Uh, terrific to be here talking to you at the Brisbane Ideas Festival. So what I'm going to talk to you about uh, tonight is um, the changing face of survival. Um, I'm actually, one day we'll write a book about this, uh, which is going to be called The Survival Curve. And I'll explain what the survival curve is to you. Those of you who've got statistical knowledge will know what a survival curve is. Um, and, um, and our survival curve is really our track from birth to death and what can influence it. If some, somebody might, yeah, that'd be great if you could close the back door. Um, and uh, you're know, stating the bleeding obvious. We're living longer than we ever have before. But the fact of the matter is we don't actually often fully appreciate why we're living longer than we ever have before. And it has it changed considerably over time. And I don't think this is on. I think I'll just take it off. Is it on? All oh right, okay. Um, I was hoping you could take it off. Um, is, is cha it's changed. Uh, can you hear me at the back without this on? Yes, I think I'll just move this bit. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I had to give a talk at uh, the Ideas Festival in Perth. And they had a very noisy board, and uh, we had a negotiation with the audience about whether I took my, f my shoes off. Um, <laughs> so I was clunking around. Um, I didn't, because it was Perth, and they're very conservative in Perth. Um, so the, the key one of the key messages here is that, in fact, we, the reason we're living longer, the reasons we're living longer, are changing and have changed through history. And uh, since the uh, early 19th century, Life expectancy has been going up around about three months a year, year in, year out. Rain, hail, shine. Goes down a little bit in wartime, goes down a bit when there's famine. But basically, in the developed world, that's how it's been increasing. And in fact, in most of the developing world, it's been going up as well. But the reasons have changed. And sometimes the reasons are really surprising. And they catch you out. And you ignore those reasons, or we ignore those reasons, at our peril. So what I want to do is take you on a Cook's tour through history and, um, and talk about some of the things that influence our health, our well-being, and how long we live. There is an axiom which was, um, uh, comes from uh, one of the greatest medical historians of, the gener of his generation uh, who died young, unfortunately, Professor Sir Roy Porter at the Wellcome Institute in London. And Roy Porter said very simple things, but it actually runs true through history. Whenever we change the way we live, new diseases arise. Whenever we change the way we live, new diseases arise. And it's just incredible the extent to which that fact's true. And you know, we have lived through HIV hitting humankind in the last tw 20 years. 30 years, and when it hit, we thought this is the first new disease ever to hit humankind. Well, it wasn't the first, and as we now know, it certainly wasn't the last new disease. New diseases emerge all the time. Old diseases re-emerge. Animal diseases escape into the human population. So let's go back to the Stone Age. Hunter-gatherers paradoxically, we're as healthy as humans were going to be until the 20th century. Height is not a bad proxy for either life expectancy or general health and well-being. 
And if you actually, if you look at the paintings, drawings of first contact, whether it be in North America with the Massachusetts tribe, or whether it be in Australia with first contact with Aboriginal people, these were tall, strong, strong-limbed peoples. Yet within a generation, their height had diminished. Their height, it wasn't just their lives that were short and miserable. It was their height as well. They became very sick after first contact. An incredible change to human longevity, which occurred within one generation. Although I'm skipping beyond um, the Stone Age, when um, the first explorers got into the middle of what's now continental United States, up to where the uh, St. Louis is now, they found a broken civilization, they found broken people and um, who were sick and dying. And what they didn't, the colonists did not realize is that at that point, which was called Cahokia, there were the largest human structures ever made, bigger than the pyramids, the mounds. There was a civilization in Cahokia with a popula- which was incredibly sophisticated, which um, was bigger in the 14th century than Philadelphia was in the 18th century. And yet, when the colonists arrived in Cahokia, all they saw were broken fragments. They had no idea what had come before. And many Americans still don't know this story. Within a generation, th- uh, things had changed incredibly dramatically. They hadn't really changed the way they lived. Other people had changed the way they lived and invaded and brought with them very different immune systems and organisms. We don't know what hunter-gatherers died from. Injury, certainly infection. They wouldn't have had terribly long lives, but they were, as I say, this is what we evolved to be. We evolved to have a lot of exercise, We evolved to actually eat quite a lot of protein, not a lot of carbs, you'd be glad to know, and um, and not much fruit. That's the diet, that that the Stone Age diet, that that is almost certainly, with with quite considerable variation, but that was by and large the Stone Age diet. Huge amount of exercise, and of course, as we all know, feast and famine. Therefore, we have the ability to store our fat for times of need. And those who would have been able to store fat best would have had a survival advantage. And so in the Stone Age are the origins of type 2 diabetes, coronary heart disease, and many of the afflictions of today. They didn't have them then, but the genetic advantage that people who survived would have had when things changed allowed um, those diseases to emerge. The biggest change that has ever occurred in the history of humankind, it's not the internet, it's not the motor car, it was agriculture. Agriculture was this huge change to the way we live. Cultivating grasses into wheat, allowing, breeding animals that could be domesticated and farmed allowed people to settle down, to stop moving around. And so the city was born, the village and then the city. So human beings were able to live in larger and larger groups. So uh, you think, well, this is a great thing to have happened. This, uh, you know, a, a more steady food supply would have been a fantastic thing for human beings, except that we became shorter. The, um, the evidence, the paleopathological evidence is that we probably lived shorter lives uh, when agriculture hit. And we certainly know this is when new dis- certain new diseases that we think are commonplace emerge. We know that measles, mumps, chickenpox did not exist in hunter-gatherer times. How do we know that? They're not animal diseases. They are purely human diseases. They need human populations to circulate. They might have come from animals once, 
smallpox, for example, which is one of the diseases that would have emerged around the time of agriculture, um, was probably a monkeypox originally and spread from, them, from, mo uh, from monkeys into humans probably pretty much the way HIV did um, 10,000 years later or whenever. Why, did measles, why do we know that me measles, mumps, chickenpox emerged about then? Round about this time, human beings started to live in larger, large enough groups that you got self-sustaining infections. So that you actually had enough humans together that these diseases started and never went away. When you were in small hunter-gatherer groups, new diseases probably emerged all the time, but they disappeared because they didn't see enough people to pass them on. They died out. This is, when the, this is the era of what we now know as childhood infectious diseases, which we now are protected against in terms of um, uh, immunization. A bad time for human health. Good time for technological development. Good time for cities. The beginning of culture. All sorts of other stuff happened. But it certainly wasn't the good old days. Major change to the way we live. Then came the Industrial Revolution. But before the Industrial Revolution came along, other things started to happen. Because civilization started to grow, culture started to grow, religion started to develop. There were wars. Wars include a change to the way we live. And often, during wartime, new diseases arise. So for example, plague, the Black Death, there have been three pandemics of plague. It's a, caused by a bug called Yersinia pestis. It lives in a wide variety. It's, it's actually an animal infection, which when it becomes virulent can spread to humans. And one way that in olden times they knew the plague was coming is that animals started to die. And when the animals started to die, particularly domesticated animals, they knew that the plague was on the way. The three, the three um, pandemics of plague. The first one was the Justinian plague, which I think was like the 6th or 7th century AD. The second pandemic started in the 14th century. That's what we commonly think of as the Black Death, where 25-30% of the population of Europe would have died. And we are still living in the third pandemic of plague right now. We are in the middle of the third pandemic of plague, which started in China in the late 19th century. The conditions in which plague starts have been roughly the same throughout history. Usually it's associated with, and this is a typical story, conjunction of circumstances, natural disasters, human disasters, and then a new disease takes off. So the, the source of plague historically was the steppe, the Russian and Chinese steppe, Mongolian steppe. And in the Black Death of the 14th century, almost certainly uh, it was carried by through the over the Silk Route into Europe. And there was a war going on in what's now known as the Crim Crimea and uh, a siege. And, the f and p almost certainly broke out during the siege. And it was taken by ship to Europe, the port of Genoa. And in fact, this is where the word quarantine comes from. Because they didn't, nobody knew about bugs and germs. But what they did know is that people were bringing this disease in. So they held ships off the port and didn't allow them to dock for 40 days. Kind of panic. Hence the word quarantine. Without any clue at all as to why, as to why, they, were, why they were doing that. So war, natural natural disaster. So I, 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 so I didn't actually explain the, the why it starts in the first place. Earthquakes and floods somehow disrupt the animal populations in the steppe area, in the, in the steppe, and somehow the bug mutates and becomes much more virulent and then escapes into other species. Seems to be the way it happens. What happened in the third pandemic of plague were earthquakes and floods in China. This seems to have been a mutation. It spread into the rat population, and it actually spread by ship around the Pacific. It came to Australia, 
there was a very, sig a very significant outbreaks in both Melbourne and Sydney, and it went to the United States. And in the United States, unlike Australia, it went into the wild animal population. So the United States has now got endemic plague. And every year in the United States, there are people who die of plague. Usually people who are hunting coyotes or skinning squirrels. They catch it from the fleas. The disaster scenario in America is, and I don't know how many of you have flown into San Francisco, but there's a mountain just near the airport, San Bruno, and there's endemic plague on that mountain. So here's the disaster scenario. An earthquake on the San Andreas Fault. A mutation in the ground rodents on San Bruno Mountain. Breakdown because of the mass chaos with a huge earthquake, and you've got an outbreak of plague. Significant pandemic. And if it becomes pneumonic plague, where it's spread by droplets, you can die within hours. So it's not going to be as bad as the Middle Ages, but we are still vulnerable. When plague hit, when new diseases arise, it also ch they also change the way we live. The Black Death in the 14th century marked the end of feudalism, of serfdom. You started getting wage labor because so many people were dying. Labor became a valuable commodity. It created fundamental changes to religion. People questioned their religion. People questioned the clergy who ran away. Some clergy stayed and died. It was the poor people who suffered most. It was the poor parts of town which suffered most from the plague. And people started questioning that. And the beginnings of the Reformation can be seated right back to the plague. So new diseases change the way we live in turn. Then comes the, the Industrial Revolution. And new diseases arise during this time too. Prior to the Industrial Revolution, you had the first, probably first travel in travel born disease. Christopher Columbus goes on his voyage, discovers the New World, lands in Hispaniola, and almost certainly the sailors contracted a form of yaws, a spirochetal disease, the same organism. It's very, it's very hard to tell the organisms apart that causes syphilis. It seems to have mutated. And it looks as though Columbus's sailors took back early syphilis to the, new, to the old world. When his sailors docked back in Spain, they had nothing to do, and they became mercenaries. And many of them fought in the siege of Naples in the late 15th century. And this terrible disease broke out at the siege of Naples. Syphilis, when it began, was this ghastly disease, this terrible skin disease, affected the nervous system. It was horrible. They did not know what hit, hit them. It was much more florid than HIV um, was in the early days. The, this was a nasty disease. So this was the uh, French and Italians fighting each other. And the Italians called it the French disease, and the French called it the Italian disease. And we still have it today. The uh, same stories that occurred with HIV occurred with syphilis. Men thinking that they could get rid of the infection by having sex with the virgin. People being blamed for it, pilloried, tortured. Um, the, uh, the, the impact, you cannot imagine the impact of this new venereal disease and the fear that it induced uh, in the 15th uh, and 16th centuries. And when the Industrial Revolution hit, it had gone into the community widely, never to be got rid of even till until today. But there's another disease that almost certainly started in the Industrial Revolution, certainly became noticed, schizophrenia. There is no convincing description of schizophrenia in ancient texts. You, can, you read about uh, you know, the prophets who were a bit bonkers you know, and had visions and things like that. And, um, you know, but n you, there was no serious description of psychosis that people have convincingly found in ancient texts. Doesn't mean to say it didn't exist, but no convincing description. Now, when I was at medical school, and those of you who are doctors here at medical school, 
we were taught schizophrenia is actually a genetic disease. And one in a hundred people get schizophrenia during their life, uh, during the course of a lifetime, whether or not you live in Melbourne, Sydney, or you know, Upper Volta. And that is absolutely not true. Work done here in Queensland by Professor John McGrath at the University of Queensland and others, uh, also at the University of Western Australia, uh, Professor Asim Jablensky, have shown that schizophrenia is actually a highly environmental condition. Yes, you've got to have the genetic susceptibility, but the environment has an enormous impact. Whether you're taking in toxins, whether your mother had uh, a prenatal infection, there's all sorts of theories abounding. But it's clear the incidence and prevalence of schizophrenia varies markedly around the world. And there is a theory that it's actually uh, when you go to a salary, job-focused economy rather than a rural-based uh, rural, rural economy, when you create the stress and environment in which schizophrenia emerges. Interestingly, schizophrenia through history has behaved a bit like an infectious disease. I explained you know, syphilis was this ghastly, florid disease. And over time, even before antibiotics, it kind of settled down. Um, as the bug got used to living with us. And schizophrenia has behaved a bit like that and to the extent that some people I think have thought that it is an infectious disease or caused by a virus or some viral element to it. Because if you talk to psychiatrists who might be in their 80s now and ask them to describe schizophrenia when they were practicing, they saw catatonia, they see people stuck in space. You don't see that anymore, even in the presenting features of schizophrenia. Maybe the treatment, or it may be that the disease actually has changed. And the way you treat the disease has changed. Schizophrenia may well be a disease of the Industrial Revolution. So what I'm, what I'm doing here is painting a picture where you think you know what causes disease. You think you know it's straightforward, but it's incredibly interlaced with the way we live the way we work, the way we love, how much money we have, and the way society is structured. And we, as I said earlier, we forget that at our peril. And then we come to the 20th century. In the 20th century, we regain the height of the Stone Age. It took all those years, 20, 30, whatever many thousand years, to regain the height of the Stone Age. And something happened in the 19th century. Because what I want to come to now is, is that it was in the 19th century where life expectancy started to take off. As I said before, three months a year, year in, year out. But the reasons have changed. If you go back to the 19th century, Men lived longer than women. For the course of human history, men have lived longer than women. Women living longer than men is a modern phenomenon of the 20th century. And it reflects the changing pattern of survival. So if you actually, and, and what this is all about is averages. The reason life expectancy was in the 30s and 40s in the 19th century was that children died, babies died, and mothers died. And it brought the whole average down. If you'd walked down Ann Street in um, 1890, there would have been plenty of elderly people in the street. Lots of young people too, but plenty of elderly people there. And yet the average life expectancy would have been 40 or something like that in, 19, in Brisbane I at that time. So the reason for a low life expectancy was death in pregnancy, um, oh childbirth, death of babies, death of children. And what happened in the early 19th century, in the, in the 19th century was that women started to live longer because of a doctor in Vienna, called Semmelweis, 
who insisted that medical students wash their hands before coming to the labor ward from having done post-mortems on women who died of purple sepsis. Didn't know what purple sepsis was then, but he knew there something was being transmitted to the labor ward. And so he knew that midwives had a much lower rate of purple sepsis than medical students and doctors. And midwives didn't dissect. And there were all sorts of other things with nurses being much safer than doctors and still to a large extent true today. The, uh, he was pilloried for this, ostracized. But the ideas which were eventually accepted took off and modern obstetrics became safe and women survived childbirth. It used to be said, it's, it's been said by some historians that it took until 1913 for it to be safer to see a doctor than to stay at home and we hope for the best. And many of us know doctors who are still stuck in 1912. <laughs> it was a dangerous time. Hospitals were dangerous places. And if you have some notion of romance about, you know, or um, an ideological view that obstetrics is this male-dominated uh, uh, patriarchal profession which takes away the rights of women and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. If you look at the developing world today where we are failing to meet the Millennium Development Goals on maternal and child health, it is those places where that ideology prevails, where they believe all you need is, a, you know, is somebody to have a baby in the dirt with a minimally trained person and um, everything will be okay. Those are the places where they still have horrendous maternal and child mortality. Developing countries which have put in a modern obstetric infrastructure, not necessarily with doctors, but with properly trained attendants, hygiene, sterility, clean places to have your baby, those are the places that are coming towards meeting the Millennium Development Goals. So moder you cannot under, uh, uh, it's impossible to really overestimate the impact that had. And that had a huge impact on life expectancy. But I want to talk about, um, I remember the guy's name, Virchow. Anthony was looking up a name for me. Then came the germ theory of disease. Pasteur and others said, well, you know, the, if, if you like, the medical profession was always behind here. They d you know, the, the community knew that, that, that there were these vapors or contagion of some kind which spread disease. There was an intuitive sense of infection without knowing what it was. And Pasteur kind of nailed it with finding that there were germs and there were germs that caused specific diseases. One of the great medical scientists of the 19th century was um, called Rudolf Virchow. He um, invented modern pathology. We would not be able, I mean, obviously somebody else would have discovered this, but essentially we would not, the, the foundations of modern pathology, when a, mo a pathologist looks down at a biopsy and diagnoses cancer, he or she is going right back to the discoveries of Virchow, this amazing medical scientist, huge brain. This amazing medical scientist in the 19th century was one of the fiercest opponents of the germ theory of disease. Why? This man was not a fool. His answer was, it's too simple. It's not as simple as that. Virchow, if he was alive today, we'd call him a raving pinko. He was absolutely committed to social change and social justice. And as a general practitioner, he had worked in Upper Silesia when there were famine and food riots in the miners in Upper Silesia. He, wa he believed in revolution. He believed in major change. And he saw the illnesses that the poor suffered and could not believe it was something as simple as a germ. And of course, both he was right and Pasteur was right. Because when Robert Koch discovered the tubercle bacillus, the cause of tuberculosis in the late 19th century in Berlin, Koch would not have known that a very high percentage of the population of Berlin at that time would have been carrying the tubercle bacillus. But only a small proportion of the population ever got TB. TB is quintessentially the social disease. It's far more than the germ. 
So Virchow was right. And TB is a really good e case study to take to describe what I'm on about here when I talk about surprising things influencing our longevity and health and well-being. There's always been this war between the curative doctors and the public health doctors, or the public health professionals, and the people who are in the curative sector. So the curative people love the drama and the clean, you know, all the stuff that people do, and we all like it when we have to have it. And the public health people say, you know, you're just wankers. If you actually look at the contribution that curative medicines made to extending longevity, it's maybe 10%. We've done it all, us public health people. So after the Second World War, people started noticing that tuberculosis rates were declining. So the curative people said, mm, triumph of modern high technology medicine. We've invented these antibiotics to hit TB and that's what's caused it to disappear. The public health people said, no, nope, you got it wrong. Going on, you know, bullshitting as usual. If you actually look at the graph of tuberculosis, you cannot see from the 19th century through into the 20th century any dip associated with the introduction of streptomycin, that's the antibiotic, the one that treats uh, tuberculosis, one of the first on the market. It's what we did in the late 19th century, the public health people said. So we got people better housing, we actually got rid of famine, we, we had got some social support into people, and that's when TB started to disappear, late 19th century. And a historian at the Australian National University, working with an historian in Germany, the historian at the National University is called Barry Smith, said, you both got it wrong. I can show you, he said, villages in Europe, side by side, just as poor, just as malnourished, with just as bad housing. Yet, from the parish records, one village seemed to live longer and have less TB. In those days, they didn't know what TB was. They called it consumption and so on. But places where they had good records, as they often do in Europe, and one side by side where things seem to be going quite well, despite the, you know, all these things that we think are so important to survival being the same. So he and this uh, other historian looked for what, were the cor what was the correlation? What explained the difference between these villages that looked the same, but one was much healthier than the other? And the factor that correlated most strongly was female literacy. Parishes and villages that taught young girls to read and write lived longer. Female literacy is one of the most potent determinants of health and longevity there is. This is not some, you know, you might think, well, who's this weird pinko sitting in front, in front of him? This has now been replicated in the 20th century in developing countries. Developing countries and even within India, if you actually look at states within India, Kerala, which has, a ver has traditionally had a very high, it's a matriarchal society, um, one of the few elected communist governments, interestingly, and a high late rates of literacy, has had European type uh, long, uh, survival rates, or li life expectancy rates. Female literacy. And don't kid yourself, the Taliban know this. They know it. They know that when you teach women to read and write, social change occurs and things will never be the same again. In this case, when you change the way you live, good things occur. Nobody really understands what the direct line is between female literacy and health, but it's a whole series of things. Possibly increased income, possibly a greater sense of control over the family's health, less susceptible to superstition and mumbo-jumbo. Who knows? But for a whole series of complicated reasons. And so that became, um, during the time of Haftan Mahler at the World Health Organization, female literacy became a health goal. And as I say, the Taliban know this. Why else are they murdering young girls in the by for going to school? They know it very dangerous if you want to maintain control and keep people in poverty to keep women um, uh, uh, subjugated. So surprising things change our, our health and well-being. So whilst longevity, whilst life expectancy was increasing quite dramatically, 
throughout the 20th century. Life, and this is life expectancy at birth because the average was increasing. More people were reaching adulthood. There was one statistic which did not change between 1890 and 1950, and that was life expectancy at 50. So if you got to 50 years old in 1890, your chances of getting to 70 or 80 were exactly the same as they would be in 1950. That statistic did not change. What has changed in our lifetime, or many of the lifetimes people in this room, is life expectancy at middle age. That's where the expansion of survival has occurred. We've kind of maxed out. We're lucky enough in this country to have maxed out, apart from Aboriginal communities, but even Aboriginal communities are getting much better with maternal and child health. Maxed out up to the age of 50. We've got all the benefits we're going to get by and large. Then it was 50. In the last 50 years, we've maxed out at 50 almost. We're now seeing an expansion of life expectancy at 75. That's where the main game is. We've done it at 50. So what is the reason for the changes of life expectancy at 50? Well, one factor is smoking. It's very hard to find somebody who's age 50 in Australia who smokes. And we've got one of the world's lowest, lowest smoking rates, but even before we got that low, people tended to give up as they hit middle age. And what we know now is that the effects of stopping smoking are actually instantaneous. You know, the, old, the, the story used to be, you know, if you went to see a GP and he said give up smoking, you know, over time your, your, your cardiac risk will come down, the cardiac heart attack or stroke. Well, that's true of lung cancer. It comes down slowly. But most people who smoke, who die prematurely because of smoking, die because of heart attacks and strokes. Your risk of a heart attack drops almost immediately, within hours. You can measure the changes to your blood vessels. It's just doesn't they don't come through in the epidemiological statistics because, you know, individuals dying. It's when you get large numbers dying accumulated that you actually start to notice the statistics. But these changes, and what we know now, is that lifestyle changes give you a benefit today, not tomorrow. You go out and do 40 minutes of moderate exercise now, of which after the talk. Your risk of dying of a heart attack drops quite dramatically and stays down for about four days and then comes back up again. It's one of the reasons why people argue for regular exercise. If you drop your blood pressure, whether that be by reducing the salt in your diet or taking a medication, taking exercise does it too, or reducing your alcohol intake, same thing. Your immediate risk drops and stays down until it comes back up again. So the effects of both lifestyle cha change and interventions such as cholesterol reduction and blood pressure reduction have had a dramatic influence on survival at middle age. And for the first time in human history, what doctors do to people is actually starting to matter. Because although you know, writing all these scripts for statins and for antihypertensives that is keeping people alive, and it's keeping people disproportionately alive. In other words, more people are surviving than the statistics from the randomized trials would suggest, particularly with statins for all sorts of reasons. Really interesting research into what makes for the exceptional survivor. So the exceptional survivor is the people that you and, Anthony, you and I, Anthony, want to be. Get to 85, we've got all our marbles, we're active, we don't have any serious disease, we might have a little few aches and pains, but essentially we're in pretty good shape. And people say, isn't he marvelous? What makes for an exceptional survival? Well, there are large cohort studies of people who uh, lo uh, are looking at people and as they age to actually do that prediction. And they've looked at people in these snapshots, in these large groups of people who they follow through the years and snapshot at say 55, and then pick them up at 85. What was it at 55 that predicted how well they were going to do at 85? Well, they don't have very high blood pressure. And if they've got high blood pressure, they've been treated for it. They generally haven't smoked. 
certainly not been smoking for a while. They're not very fat. They're not very thin either, but they're not obese. They're getting a bit of exercise. So it's the stuff you kind of know. In men, it's being married. And in women, it's not being married. <laughs> and ladies, you know what I'm talking about. And we have, st we have distorted views about what really influences our health and well-being. I wish I could come here. I'd probably make a fortune if I could say, you know, it's this little mung bean. You know, you just go take the Norman Swan mung bean and you'll live forever. It's a, you know, that's why I'll die poor. You know, it's the, uh, it's the, it's the boring stuff. Um, apparently, one way to get people to stop smoking is to tell them the tobacco leaf has been dipped in pesticides. Yeah, I'm not going to smoke that. It might kill me. And people have actually started, you know, have made organic cigarettes. I mean, that's how distorted our view can be. Um, I do want to leave time for conversation, but there's just some other stuff I just want to talk to you about because people say, well, "What's what's been, you know, the, the the most? What have been the major medical findings which have have you know ha have had impact?" And you can go on through lists. But I, I, I think it, it is actually s something quite, um, if you like, mundane. If you go and see the doctor and uh, the, your cholesterol might be up a little bit, the doctor will say, look, if you take this cholesterol tablet, your, um, your, um, your risk of dying of a heart attack will drop by 30%. And you think, oh, fantastic. Give me the, give me the, um, the drug. But 30% of what? And uh, statistics have shown that GPs don't are not good at this. They're not good at actually, th this, is the, this is the drug company advertising. The drug company reps come and see them and they talk in these what's called relative risk terms. And they're not lying. Your risk of coronary heart disease does drop by 30%. But it's 30% of what? If you've got a one in two million chance of dying of a heart attack in the next year, dropping it by 30% is two thirds of bugger all, or one third of bugger all. So why would you bother? And then what does it mean? What, 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 what sort of benefits do you actually get in terms of years? So th this book that I'm writing, or one day will write, uh, and it's quite hard to get some of these statistics out. What I wanted to do was actually translate it into years. What, sh what actually does it mean? That's what, we f that's what counts. How many more? If I take a cholesterol-reducing drug, am I going to live for four years, five years, six years? If I take exercise, you know, will I ever get the time back that I've spent exercising? <laughs> What What is the story? And so this is the survival curve. And you'll see that it hits the deck at around about 100. Because babies being born today will probably live to about 100. You know, f only 50 years ago, living to 100 was a genetic abnormality. Nice abnormality, but genetic abnormality. People were abnormally young. And uh, you, know, you probably have met them. So the, the, the centenarian studies that have been done show that People who, um, uh, many of the people who live to 100 are young, older, and they're running major companies in the 70s and 80s, and they look young. And uh, interestingly, the other feature that they have is how they respond to stress. It's not that they've had stress-free lives. You know, they've lived through the Holocaust, they've whatever. It's how they respond to stress. They get over it. So on that basis, I've probably got about five minutes to talk before I cock it. But... Um, so, that, that's so but, but increasingly, we will live into our 90s. Most people in this room will live into their 90s, if not beyond. Living to 100 will not, will not require the genes to live to 100. So, if you smoke, that's the biggest number. If a woman is smoking 20 cigarettes a day at the age of 20, she'll take 14 years off her life. 14 years. And for men, it's about the same. If it's 30 cigarettes a day, it's like 19 years off your life. <coughs> Obesity is not that strong a risk factor. It's, you know, everybody goes on about it. It is a risk factor, but it's hard to measure. It, um, exercise can actually abolish the risks associated with obesity. Two or three years, maybe. <coughs> Being sedentary is actually bigger than obesity. <coughs> High blood pressure can, uh, you know, rip two or three years off your life. <coughs> and cholesterol, pretty much the same. 
I, I'm being um, slightly facetious, no, no, simplistic about this because it's actually not arithmetical how this works. It's complex algorithms and it doesn't add up so that if you do everything, you know, you're going to turn back into a 20 year old. It doesn't happen that way. Um, but for simplicity, that's the way I've uh, described it. But of course, this can be reversed as I've discussed. And you can actually get your survival curve back to where it was. And you can actually exceed it. There's no question that you can be beyond it. The challenge for our community is how to make that happen evenly across society. Because the people in this room, we're ahead of the curve. You live in an Aboriginal community, you're behind the curve. But there's a story here for Aboriginal communities. Um, whilst you cannot, for a moment, uh, under, uh, over underestimate, well, I think it's too late at night now, but you know what I'm saying, you cannot minimize the importance of um, recognition of injustices to uh, or the Australian Indigenous communities. Recognize that uh, th their ownership of the land and all the things that have been done to them. The reality is, it's about an 11 year gap now. You could get rid of most of that gap by getting rid of smoking, reducing blood pressure, reducing cholesterol. The gap's almost gone. That's where the gap is. Very hard to do. But in Aboriginal communities, Aboriginal health workers smoke at a higher rate than the community itself. <coughs> we have the advantage of having uh, the people that look after us, the doctors and nurses, have, don't smoke. So there we have role models. Aboriginal communities don't have those role models. So the target in some Aboriginal anti-smoking uh, exercises have been to get elders and Aboriginal health workers to stop smoking. But you could get rid of the gap very quickly, very, very quickly, within not even a generation, you know, with a quarter of a generation, you could get rid of the gap. And here's just the representation. You know, I was talking about relative risk versus what I call absolute risk, which is, and what absolute risk is, is your own personal risk when you add up all the factors. And as I said earlier, it's not arithmetical. It actually multiplies. So if you have, if you're, and most people who die of heart disease and stroke have a little bit of this and a little bit of that. If all you've got is a slightly raised cholesterol. You don't smoke, there's not a strong family history, and um, your blood pressure is normal. It's unusual to find that. But if that's all you've got, you don't need a statin. Your risk is actually quite low. But most of us, putting on a little round the waist, not getting quite enough exercise, maybe we smoke a little, and it multiplies. So the risk is actually more than one and one equals two. And it's actually recognizing that slight increases in each of these elements can put us at major risk of dying of coronary heart disease, uh, stroke, and, um, and even cancer. The, uh, uh, and we increasingly should be asking our general practitioners to actually assess that risk so that we can actually deal with it Properly. So in terms of reversing that risk, yes, stopping smoking, yes, taking exercise. Diet, I'm often asked about what are the elements of diet here, and we get obsessed with individual nutrients. Should I be taking selenium? Should I be taking vitamin E? Should I be taking vitamin C? So randomized trials of people taking antioxidant supplements, 270,000 people we're talking about here when you bring together the systematic review, if you take antioxidants, you die sooner. <laughs> Corrected for your health, well-being, and so on. There is no, at the best you can say, is there's no measurable benefit. The death is probably comes from, rate comes from beta carotene in smokers, but you know, vitamin E is maybe a little bit dubious. Vitamin C is probably neutral. So individual nutrients don't work. Increasingly, people talk about dietary pattern. It's how you eat and what you eat globally. There are cofactors in our foods which we don't know, we don't understand, which affect our health and well-being. So if you eat the Mediterranean diet, the Mediterranean diet is variously defined. People talk about the Cretan diet because that's where it was studied 
in the 50s and 60s, most, you know, I don't think anybody in Crete eats the Cretan diet anymore. So the Cretan diet was um, not much red meat, a lot of fish, white meat, or not even a lot of that. The pr you know, protein wasn't that high. The not a lot of carbohydrate, and such carbohydrate, very low glycemic index. Sourdough bread was a sort of Cretan thing. And, um, and eating, the closer you adhere, uh, basically the nutritionists talk about elements of a diet. And there are about eight or nine elements that make up a Mediterranean diet. And interestingly, those eight or nine elements are very similar in the Asian diet. It looks different, but it's pretty much the same and um, in terms of the type of foods that you get. And it's the way you cook the food. Research done at Melbourne, at the, at the Baker Institute in Melbourne, into things called um, advanced glycation end products, ages. It's the brown stuff in food. The Mediterranean diet and Asian diet to a certain extent, they don't burn things, they don't barbecue. They cook more slowly. And therefore you don't get these contaminants, these burnt products, which seem to accelerate aging. And who can quantify the survival benefits of sitting on the veranda overlooking the Aegean Sea? Um, alcohol is probably just a nice thing to have. And interestingly, whilst you don't, you know, I won't ask you to put up your hands who's got the extra virgin olive oil sitting there in the cupboard. It's not monounsaturates that really are having the impact. It's polyunsaturated fats that have much more impact on your health and well-being, which are still there in the Mediterranean diet through fish. Um, so, and also the cooking oil. So canola, sunflower seed, uh, oil. So it's essentially there's still quite a lot of polyunsaturated fats in the Mediterranean diet, and they seem to be more important. And how you eat. Because our brains are part of our bodies. The way we live, globally has an influence on how well we live and our sense of well-being. And that's not some soft namby-pamby thing. Good research by a major neuroscientist, Bruce, Bruce McEwen at Rockefeller University in New York, has shown that the level of chronic stress, not acute stress by going on the fast rides, but chronic stress, feeling out of control of your life, feeling that your life is dominated by others who are telling you what to do and you cannot take control of your life, and make decisions either about your life or the way you work is highly toxic. Changes the way your brain works, changes hormonal control in your bodies. Certainly seems to be related to diabetes, coronary heart disease, and may well be related to some forms of cancer. So here you have it. Life is a fatal condition. And you can decide that you're gonna make the loose a little bit stronger by starting cigarettes and getting a little bit heavier sitting down watching the footy with a beer in your hand. But then you can decide to change it all and make a difference. Take some exercise. Take a bit more exercise and lose some weight. Throw away, <laughs> throw away the cigarettes and live forever. Thank you very much.